Uh, my name is Michelle Villafranca. I'm with the city of Fort Worth. And um, I am a park operations planner for the parks department. Some of you may have known me from the Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge, where I worked for 11 years as a natural resource specialist, as well as um, I was a forester for the city of Fort Worth. And before all that, I worked for the Nature Conservancy and the National Park Service and the U.S. Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, probably most people, if you do know me, know me from the Nature Center, though. Um, before we get rolling on this, um, again, how you, whoa, somebody wrote on my screen. How did that happen? <laughs> we'll just leave it. Um, uh, if you could mute your audio and turn off your video so that we get better uh, bandwidth, use the chat to submit questions and um, I'll answer questions at the end. So let's see how I can get started. All right, this is Pollinators of North Central Texas. I want that go. So you'll excuse me for my uh, inability to multitask. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to talk about uh, first different forms of pollinators or of pollination. So we have, and I don't know how to get that off my screen. Whoops, let's go back. So I apologize for the lines on my PowerPoint. I don't know how to get them off. Um, there's entomophily, which is pollination by insects. You have anonophily, which is pollination by the wind, and zoophily, which is pollination by uh, vertebrates. There um, are different types of pollination. Uh oh, some lost. Someone says they lost audio. I should not be muted. So you might try pushing your mute button and that, that way so you can get back in and you can hear. So the, there are other types of pollination. Those are, you know, by winds, by um, mammals and by insects. But there are ways that things get that flowers get pollinated. Okay, so can everyone mute? It's the button down at bottom left corner, it's little microphone and you push on that and mute it. Okay. Oops. Okay. Sorry about that. So in Incidental pollination is where oh, I'm having a lot of trouble multitasking on this. <laughs> okay, incidental pollination is where insects will come along and they're, they're pollinating, but they're not intending to pollinate. They, um, it's, it's like mammals, this, this, uh, rodent here is pollinating but not really meaning to pollinate. Um, I think that is an animal from, uh, it's not from the U.S., it's probably from Australia, but that would be an incidental pollinator. They're not really intending to pollinate, they just um, do it by chance. Then there's accidental pollination, which is also, um, they're also pollinating, but they're not really after the, um, the pollen per se, they're after the nectar. Um, and, and so they're going in getting the nectar and then they're just getting pollen on them. And then intentional pollinators are those that are going for the nectar and they're going for pollen and they have really evolved to be pollinators. Okay, next slide. So when we think of uh, pollinators, we don't really think of, um, of 
mammals pollinating too much or birds pollinating too much. Uh, hummingbirds, you know, they never land or perch on anything. They're, um, they hover. So they're not really the greatest of pollinators. Um, and also you see on the slide that there's no landing platform on the, flower, on the flowers for them to land on. So that's kind of a disadvantage. That's why that there are long floral tubes for um, the hummingbirds pollinate. Um, when they're, they're getting the nectar, they, they have the long, the flowers have the long floral tubes. So some other plants that attract um, pollinators would be these that are listed down here, coral beans, standing cypress, uh, cardinal flower, lemon bee balm, coral honeysuckle, and trumpet vine. Um, those attract hummingbirds. I can't say that I've really seen hummingbirds going for lemon bee balm, but definitely like standing cypress and coral honeysuckle and trumpet vine. Another, um, another uh, pollinator would be a mammal, it would be bats. So the long-nosed bat and um, there's another bat, uh, the Mexican long-nosed bat that pollinate um, flowers specifically, as well as fruit bats. In North America, though, the, the long-nosed bat is specifically pollinating um, saguaro cacti. So the saguaros are in the Sonoran Desert and they have, they only, the flowers only bloom one, one time at night and these bats come in and they pollinate the saguaro flowers. The bats are actually able to hover. Um, I'm still admitting people in. Um, and how they're finding the saguaro flowers, in addition to echolocation, obviously, they're attracted to white flowers. So saguaros, they grow really tall. They put on white flowers. They open one time at night, um, or the flower opens only once at night. And that's how these bats are able to uh, pollinate. Let's see. So I threw this in my presentation. Again, excuse these yellow lines. I don't know how they got on there. It was from annotation from Zoom somehow. Um, I found this really interesting because <laughs> You don't think of hummingbirds as eating insects. I mean, they will eat tiny little insects for some protein supplement, but they're not, you know, like an insectivorous bird, right? But somebody somehow either caught a hummingbird trying to eat a honeybee, or maybe the hummingbird, it was just a coincidence they were both in the same place, or the hummingbird was trying to fend off the bee. But at any rate, the picture looks like the hummingbird's going to eat the bee. So the base of the food chain is our pollinators, right? They're an important food source for all of our wildlife and they're building up for all the mammals um, and other animals higher up the food chain. Uh, native bees are the most efficient and effective pollinators for uh, North Texas or for actually for any, any part of Texas. Um, to maintain our e ecosystems in Texas. And the value of pollinators was estimated um, by Parks and Wildlife to be $3 billion. Now, that's just native bee population. Um, that doesn't count honeybees, which are not native to the U.S. They're European honeybees, and they were brought over um, for agriculture or food production. that more than 85% of our flowering plants require pollination by animals, and that would mostly be by insects. Um, and many native uh, plants are pollinated only by native pollinators. So let's see if I can do the poll. Okay, so I'm gonna launch a poll. We're gonna test this and see how it works. Um, I'm launching poll number one. So I'll give you all a couple of minutes and if you can see the poll, try answering it. Um, 
so the question is, what is the benefit of pollen for bees? And would it be fat or protein or a food source for their young? Um, yeah, you just answer the question and then I'll, I'll show you the poll results in a minute. I'll wait for a couple more people to answer it. Ah, while I fidget with everything on my screen. Only want the mouse. Okay, so let's see. What did we say? I'm going to end the polling. And so it looks like quite a lot of people said food source to feed their young. And some people said fat and some people said uh, protein. So the benefit for for bees with pollen is really all of the above. It was kind of a trick question um, because they're using the, the protein and fat in the pollen and they're feeding their young. So up oh, there, there are the results. So I give you all a minute to look at that. Okay. All right. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, so pollen is for protein and fat. Now the bees, they um, are native bees, have what is called pollen baskets and combs. Um, so these are specialized for pollinating. So on the rear outside leg, they have a pollen basket, which I'll, I'm sure you can see it, but I'm going to see if I can use the laser pointer right here. That's the pollen basket. So on what they do is they get up in a flower and this bee is really digging into that foxglove, kind of burrowing in there and it's getting this pollen all over, all over the bee. And so the bee will then take the rear leg, the comb, and scrape off the pollen and then rub it onto the pollen basket. So it's not truly a basket. We know that it's just kind of like the elbow area of a bee's knees, maybe a bee's knee, close to a bee's knees. And, and they're just rubbing it onto their, um, onto their knee just as a way to transmit the pollen. So if you think of um, other insects, not bees, they don't have pollen baskets, so they haven't evolved to be such a, um, an efficient pollinator. Let's see. Uh, let me try to go to the next slide here. So you have also the difference between um, long tongue bees and short tongue bees. Um, that difference actually creates a problem for the short tongue bees, uh, which they have overcome. So long, long tongued bees can reach deep into a flower to get the nectar, but short tongue bees can't. So if you have a flower with like a long floral tube or it's just a large flower, the um, Short tongue bees have evolved. Somehow they figured out how to nectar rob. So what they're doing is they're um, probing into the extra floral nectary of the flower, which is at the bottom below the ovaries. So they're not going up to the top and pushing down to get nectar like other species. Um, they are actually just going straight to the source and digging in and um, getting the pollen that way. It's kind of like a beer bong maybe, <laughs> I don't know. You know, instead of drinking out of the can, you're just um, using that tube. And so that is an evolution uh, probably for, for flowers um, to get more pollination than possible. So if they're attracting these species to them, 
um, to get the nectar, then in turn, th that also increases their chances for being pollinated. Uh, let's see. Next slide. Flowers have adapted as well. Um, they've adapted nectar guides. Um, so that's just these different markings on flowers. And I have several different flowers uh, shown here. A foxglove, which is right here, and skullcap, and uh, spring beauty, and agalinus, and um, black-eyed Susan. So each of these look a little bit different. They have a different shape. And each of the markings are guides for different species and probably generally for um, pollinators, but I'm sure that each of these are attracting certain species that are more specific to these. So the foxglove, if you've ever been out looking at um, foxglove and you see a bumblebee come up and squeeze into the foxglove or squeeze into the agalinus, they're, um, th it's just like it was made to perfectly for their bodies, right? They fit in perfectly and that's how the pollen gets on them. So something like um, the skull cap would be tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny little solitary bees that would be um, pollinating that. And then the Claytonia, I haven't actually seen something pollinating it, but obviously creatures do. Um, but I would assume it would be very tiny uh, solitary bees and probably some fly species like gnats. Um, just little insects. And the black-eyed Susan is really interesting because it has UV markings. Um, and I don't know, there are probably several other species that have UV markings, but the black-eyed Susan, I found this, this picture on the internet that I thought was really interesting. So it's basically like a landing pad. It's like the, like an airport, like the runway lights that lead, um, pollinators into the prize, right? So if um, on the, the, the Black Eyed Susan, the yellow part right here is the UV uh, reflection that they're landing. So they land on that and then they, it guides them in. Okay, the next slide, if I can highlight it. Okay. There are some floral preferences um, for pollination specializations. And um, one of those, I have them listed here. So you have the color, the bloom time, shape, patterns, uh, scent. And um, each of these uh, really affects whether a plant's gonna get pollinated. So some, some butterfly species, probably most of them really prefer certain colors of flowers versus others. So blue flowers and um, green flowers aren't nearly as attractive to a wider range of species as purple and yellow and white flowers. Uh, bloom time is really important. So if you think about when a pollen, pollinator will emerge um, from the ground or metamorph. What is their key plant or are they a generalist and what's blooming? So not er we know not everything is blooming all at once, right? It goes from like February all the way through November. We have blooming, especially in um, really any part of Texas, but North Texas especially. Uh, also the shape's really important. So you have flowers that have petals that are, you know, uh, big wide petals like Anothera uh, species. And then you have um, thistles where they have to kind of dig around. Then you have um, Asteraceae, so sunflowers that have lots and lots and lots of um, disc flowers. Uh, the scent is really important and patterns like we just talked about before. So. Let me see if we can do poll two. Uh, maybe we can't. Oh. Let's see, poll two. All right, we're gonna try that. Okay, so which pollinator purposefully visits flowers? 
So I'll give y'all a couple of seconds to answer that if you can see it. Okay, we got some people answering. I'm gonna check out chat real fast. It looks like uh, Suzanne's helping to answer some of the questions that are in chat. So I'll put that down. Okay, so let's see, we're still, we're still getting some answers. All right, I'm gonna end the polling and share. Share the results. Hopefully y'all can see that. It looks like nobody thinks moss uh, do any kind of pollination with purpose. Uh, had a good chunk of people said butterflies, more than two thirds said bees, some people said wasps, and some people said ants. So um, bees, bees are very intentional pollinators. And the reason is because they are searching for pollen and nectar. So pollen for their young, pollen to provision their nests, um, nectar for themselves. Oh, and I forgot to mention, let's see, let me drop the poll here. Uh, flower constancy is in relation to purposefully um, um, pollinating. Bees find it more effective to go around to the same species of flowers. So um, whenever you landscape a garden, you know how um, I'm a really messy gardener and I landscape with all kinds of things and they're just all over the place and I have trouble putting them into groupings but it is really preferred by pollinators if you put them in groups so they don't have to spend as much energy going here and then there and there. If they could kind of go, I hate to say this, but it's kind of like the Walmart, right? If they could go to one place to get just about everything that they need, um, then it's easier for them. So, um, one way that bees are super special, our, our native bumblebees, that is, are super special is um, buzz pollination. So I'm sure a lot of people have probably looked at buzz pollination on the interwebs or maybe you've witnessed it. I did do a video of some buzz pollination the other day because it's just so fascinating. Uh, but I thought if I can, I would share, let's see, the video if I still have it up. Let's see, let me share that and we'll just play like a couple of seconds of it. Um, and then I will explain. And let me go back to our presentation. No, what was that? No. Hold on. Ah, there we are. No. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So if anyone can um, just send me a message and make sure that you see the screen that I switched back to, back to my presentation. So the thing that's really interesting about buzz pollination is the, um, the bees will grab hold of the anthers. So they grab hold of the, um, you know, the floral part that has the, the pollen like this bee in this picture is like grabbing hold of it. And they're not doing this. Like that's what I thought originally thought buzz pollination is like they're shaking their whole body. But basically what they're doing is they're shaking their wings. So they're buzzing their wings. I don't know if you can see me, but they do this. Like it's like shaking your shoulders and all of the pollen's falling down into onto their, um, their stomach, 
right? And then they use their, their uh, combs to create those floral um, sacs, the floral, um, bleh, not floral, <laughs> the pollen sacs. And then they go back to their nest and put that in their nest to provision it. So there's the native, uh, there are several native flowers that are especially adapted for our native bumblebees for pollination. Um, the shooting star is one, that's a really nice example and you can see how it got its name, right? A sh um, shooting star. Let's see, let me go to the next screen. So what I did here is um, I just grabbed this really taxonomically crazy looking chart <laughs> And then I um, put a box around uh, plant families that are native to North Texas and generally native to Texas um, that require buzz pollination. So I don't know if you can read it. It's kind of hard to read, but uh, day flowers, um, irises, anything in the lily family, the uh, matter family, the gentane, potato, uh, the Malvaceae, uh, marshmallow, the mellow, mallow family, and euphorbia. So I just have over here the floral part. So the stamen is stamen. That's what's producing the pollen. And then you have the ovary right here. Um, uh, why did I? Put, oh, I just put this picture here of a day flower a close-up of a day flower because I think it's so fascinating because it's showing you that it's really not possible for a pollinator to land on it, right? That's why um, bees will grab a hold of it. It's just not made um, to be convenient, I suppose. Um, let's see, I already shared results on that. Now I'm going to see uh, I had poll three, so let's see what, uh, what I'm asking in poll three. I kind of went overboard on the polls just because this is my first time to do it, so I'm, I'm testing out polls. But the question is, nectar is an important energy source composed of, is it composed of water, or proteins, or fat, or sugar, or all, or none? Maybe it's a trick question. So I'll give you a couple of minutes. Y'all are fast on that. Let's see, we got 55% of people have voted. We're up to 65%. The pressure's on 74, 76. We're slowing down. People are still thinking. All right, I think I'm going to stop there. We got 81% of the vote in. This is just like the November elections, but for naturalist nerds. Okay, I'm stopping and I'm going to share the results. So we had um, nobody thought water is an important energy source, that nectar is an important energy source composed of water. Uh, some people thought proteins, only 1% thought fat. And the rest of you said sugar. Bing, you're right, sugar. So good job, y'all. All right, let me close that. We'll go to the next, next slide. Arr. I need an IT assistant here. All right, so what are the uh, four orders of insects that are most responsible for pollination? You see Hymenoptera, which are bees, wasps, and ants. They live in colonies, but some are solitary. They collect pollen for their offspring, which is the major important aspect of uh, them. And they have four wings. So obviously ants uh, don't have four wings, but Hymenoptera includes ants. I don't think that ants are too responsible for um, pollination though. Lepidoptera would be butterflies and moths, so they're solitary. They're not living in colonies. They collect uh, pollen uh, for themselves, but they're not giving it to their young. Um, they have four wings and they have colored scales. 
and then diptera are flies. So these are things that we generally think are really pesky. Um, and we, you know, we swat them away, but they're really, they're actually pretty good pollinators, um, but they're just kind of mm, the underdogs, I guess. Um, they're also collecting pollen for themselves, but not for their offspring. And they have two wings and Coleoptera, which are beetles, and they're collecting pollen for themselves as well. So really bees um, are the only ones that are collecting the pollen for themselves and for their offspring. We'll go to the next one, there. So this is um, a list of nine bumblebees that you might find in Texas, not all probably right here in North Texas. Um, but it, I just thought it was a really neat graphic uh, to quickly kind of narrow down identification of bumblebees. So Texas has 700 or about 700 native bee species and nine of those are bumblebee species. Next. Okay. So now we're going to break it down and we're going to look at bumblebees in particular. So bumblebees are social bees and they're living in colonies, but they're not big colonies like you would, um, you know, like honeybees would live in. They're gonna nest in rodent burrows or grass thatch. They work collaboratively and cooperatively and they defend their nests, but maybe not, they're not so aggressive when they're foraging. So when you see them out um, going to flowers, they're just, it's like they're drunk on nectar and they're not um, not gonna defend anything. There's nothing to defend. They're away from their nest. But if you were to find their nest, then maybe, maybe they would see you as a threat. Um, this is a picture of a bumblebee nest that someone brought to the 2014 North American Prairie Conference that was held at Botanic Gardens. And I was so fascinated by it because I had actually not seen a bumblebee nest in person. Um, that's pretty embarrassing being that I'm a naturalist, but I haven't seen one <laughs> out in the wild. Um, so the interesting thing about bees is they're central foragers that, so they have a nest and then the females are going out from the nest and um, it's not just the, the queen, she's kind of doing her thing, but the uh, worker bees are female and they're not going to go super far out from their nest. Um, and they're, they're uh, basically provisioning the nest. So I got this off of the Xerces Society uh, website and I thought it was just too good of a graphic to uh, not use in this, but basically I'll read it in case it's tiny print for y'all. Basically the queen um, of a bumblebee emerges from hibernation in the spring and she finds the nest site such as an abandoned rodent burrow, they're not reusing the same nest from one year to, a ne to the next, and it's not the same queen each year. They have an annual life cycle. So this new queen, she creates um, a nest for the nectar and the pollen, and she lays her eggs. So when the daughters um, emerge, those are the worker bees, um, they take over the foraging and other duties. So um, the, the queen is busy making more bees and then I guess she kind of kicks back once she has some worker bees. Um, and then in the fall, uh, they've got a colony going and they have their male bees and the queens and the males leave to go find mates. So the original queen is going to die and then the males are going to die after they mate and the worker, the female worker bees are going to die. Um, they live for like one or two months. The queen will go out and she'll um, uh, fertilize. They'll have new queens and they'll get, get fertilized by these males that are out and about and then those new queens hibernate over winter. Um, let's see. So some interesting uh, bee species. We have the brown belted bumblebee um, and they, they, just like some other native bumblebees, they nest underground in colonies of up to 50. 
Um, it could be more, but I think generally they're about 50 and they're dividing the labor amongst the different casts, but they're working like you have the young doing one, uh, one thing first being born and then they turn, they become worker bees and they help with building the nest. And then the older bees also are helping kind of tend the young. The ones that are in the middle age group are the ones that are going out and foraging and bringing stuff back. Um, and then of course you have the queen. So as they're going through their life cycle, for one bee is doing many different th things throughout their life and they will aggressively defend their colony. Um, this other bee is the American bumblebee and it was supposedly one of the most prevalent bees in the U.S. but there was um, there's been great decline. I imagine that pretty much all bumblebees there's great decline and it's not just the American bumblebee but the um, at attribution of why they're declining could be um, a parasite, which is that Nosema bombi. Um, and it could also be pesticide and habitat loss and degradation. Um, those are some given obvious ones. Now the, um, the uh, parasite <clears throat> that is affecting the bumblebee, the American bumblebee. It doesn't actually kill the bumblebee. What it does is it um, basically affects the sperm of the male bees so that it's just reducing their chance of um, successful mating. So then you have fewer bees. So it actually affects the male sperm and therefore the possibility of more males. So you can imagine that that's going to kind of tamp down on um, the number of bees you would have and their population would crash if you don't have uh, successful procreation. So some other types of bees are solitary bees. There's 90% 90, 90 of, the, of the bees that we have in Texas are solitary bees. So we have our bumblebees, which are um, cologne live in colonies and then you have all the rest of the native bees are solitary. They nest in the ground <clears throat> or uh, they prefer open uh, ground but they can also nest in pith and dead wood and wildflower stems and they don't defend their nest because they're solitary so they just probably flee when they um, if they feel threatened. Um, one interesting thing about pith nesting in stems of wildflowers. This is why I, uh, let me check chat real fast. This is why I um, don't clean up my flower beds over the winter. Okay, someone's saying yes, touch your screen to enlarge if you want to look at a picture <clears throat> more closely if, you if you're on a phone. Um, so in my garden, it, I have flowers blooming all year, all the way into November. And then I leave all that dead standing material, the plants, I leave them because that's cover. It's material for winter birds that are um, migrating here, like your sparrows. And also I want to leave the debris in the same place where it was because of the pith nesters. So what I do is I leave it standing and then like in February or March, I then come along and I cut the, the stalks down, but I let them lay down into my flower bed so that whatever was using that plant as their host plant is nearby for the, the spring season's growth of that same plant, which will be the host plant. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> mm. It's hard to see the button. Okay. So some solitary bees that are ground nesters, we have um, digger bees. So they live in the same habitat as the Comanche harvester ant. Um, they, their nest is solitary, but they're in dense aggregations. Uh, so where I've seen them is in this real sugar sand soil at the Fort Worth Nature Center. It's just, it's basically like beach sand. 
and <clears throat> there's whole colonies of them in that sand and that's the same um, habitat that Comanche harvester ants are in. What the, the males do is they'll emerge, I think this is pretty common in quite a few solitary bees, they'll emerge first in the spring and they cruise around the nesting site looking for other females. Um, so then the females will then emerge and then the males are just right there. So it's kind of like hanging out on Sunset Strip or something. You're a guy and you're waiting there to see what, what uh, ladies are passing by and you put your moves on them. Um, <clears throat> so then we have sweat bees. And I think most people are familiar with sweat bees. They are attracted to sweat. The females are carrying the pollen, but not the males. So um, I guess it's like the females are cooking and the males are um, looking, for, looking for the ladies probably. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So they're provisioning their nest with pollen and then the adults are eating nectar. And so you've had probably like a bee land, a sweat bee land on you. There are several species of sweat bees, so, but generally, you know, they're about that big. They kind of look like a fly at first, and then you realize, no, it's a bee. Um, then there's uh, mining bees, um, which I don't really know too much about. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, squash bees. And so I find squash bees really fascinating because um, squash flowers, or flowers in that family, uh, the Cucurbitae, family are um, opening only in the morning and then they close up by the um, afternoon when it gets really hot. And so the squash bees are actually, they've got to hang out by that plant or in that area where those species of cucurbitae, cucurbitae um, are growing so that they can pollinate it. And so they'll actually do their thing. They'll actually mate on the flower of the squash. So it's like they want everything all, they want their cake and, and eat it too. Um, <clears throat> and I also read that, uh, and I don't know this by personally because I haven't done it, but that squash bees will go down about two feet for their nest. I've never tried to dig up a squash bee nest, but um, you know, you'd probably have to dig about two feet according to what I've read. <clears throat> So some other solitary bees that would be in wood um, or pith of flower stems are mason bees. So they're nesting in abandoned wood boring beetle cavities. So that shows you, oh, okay, you have, you know, you have some animals that are using abandoned nests of rodents like bumblebees. And then we have mason bees who are using abandoned um, wood boring holes or holes from uh, wood boring beetles. So everything is kind of reused, kind of like reduce, recycle, reuse. Um, so the mason bees are nesting in that. They're, so obviously they're not making their own nest. Uh, I mean, they're not excavating their own nest. <clears throat> and they're using mud to uh, put the plugs in and kind of line the nest. So mason bees, um, they'll actually, you know, start at the back of the hole. They'll um, provision it with nectar, I mean with pollen, they'll lay their um, egg in there and then they seal it up with a partition of mud. That's why they're mason bees. Well, what they do is they put the females, and I don't know how they know this, I mean it's like nature is so incredible, they, the females are laid at the very back of the nest and then the males are up at the front. So the males are gonna hatch first and they're gonna come out and then they're hanging out. And so they're in like a um, aggregation. So it's not just only one, you know, solitary bee. It's an aggregation <clears throat> um, of solitary bees. So they'll hatch and then the males are swarming around looking for a mate and then the females come out. So I think that's just so amazing. How can they, decide <laughs> how did nature figure out that the females go in at the very beginning because the males are going to hatch earlier and then the males are able to uh, cruise for a mate that way. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Eastern carpenter bee, they nest in wood. They don't have a queen bee. They're not doing anything collaboratively um, or cooperatively like a bumblebee would. They're eating pollen and nectar. 
um, and they burrow, they drill into wood. So uh, some people, I guess people call the exterminator because they're like, oh my gosh, carpenter bees are, you know, drilling into my eaves. Well, I seriously doubt that a whole house is going to fall down because of a carpenter bee versus termites. Um, and in fact, I just found uh, some carpenter bees are actually going at my house. They're going up under the ridge of um, a metal roof that I have on an awning. And I guess they're drilling into the plywood that's underneath, but I'm just like, yay, I've got carpenter bees. Um, another bee that's interesting is the leaf cutter bee. So they're um, cutting leaves, right? And they're putting it into their nest and provisioning their nest. Well, um, the leaves are actually, you know, why would they do that? I have to always ask questions. Why? I wanna know, I'm curious. Well, the reason they're cutting the leaves is because when they stick it in there, likely that's providing moisture in their um, nest. So let's see, I had another poll. Let's see what, uh, poll five. So, all right, I didn't skip poll four. Which bees have an annual life cycle? Would it be honeybees? bumblebees or solitary bees. <clears throat> wow, okay, we got 26% of the vote, 36, 40, 50. <laughs> okay, we got 71%, we're slowing down. Okay, um, okay, all right, we're gonna end the polling and see what we got, share results. All right, so which bees have an annual life cycle? Honeybees, bumblebees, or solitary bees? So the answer um, is actually bumblebees. So bumblebees, um, you know, they have the queen, they have their colony, the queen dies um, after she's mated and um, the original queen dies at the end of the season and the new queen um, is bred basically and then she goes and finds the new nest site and then she hibernates over winter and as you know honeybees their um, hives could go on for years and they just keep going so they're um, not an annual okay I'm gonna sh stop sharing results So we're moving on to wasps. You know, my legs are getting sore. I'm sitting on the floor, oh, <laughs> on a hardwood floor. Um, so we have five banded tiffid wasps. I think they're really interesting because, uh, well, when I first saw it, I was like, what is that? It's so, they're like, I don't know if you can see my, my finger. So they're like about an inch or more long. Um, and at first you think it's a, a yellow jacket, but it's not. So their larvae, um, they feed their larvae grubs. Um, and what the, what their larvae, well, whatever they feed their larvae, what the larva does is it feeds on the non-essential tissue first. So they capture their prey, they stick it in their nest with their larva, they lay their eggs, the larva hatch, and um, the predator, I mean, the prey is paralyzed, right? It's still alive. And then the grub of the tiffid wasp starts eating the non-essential tissues first, which that's very science fiction-y. Um, and what a horrible way to go, right? Like, I'm actually glad that I'm a human and not um, a prey item for wasps um, or spiders. So they nest and overwinter in the soil and the adults feed on nectar. And so this is, uh, I forgot to mention that almost all the pictures um, in my presentation, if they don't have a name attribute to the picture or pictures that I've taken in my yard. So my yard's like full of plants. And so this tiffid wa wasp um, is pollinating or feeding on um, 
goldenrod. So I have two species of goldenrod in my yard and I actually um, collected them just kind of off the county road, <laughs> uh, right by my mailbox. And um, they, they start blooming in September. They go all the way through November. And so that means I have pollinators, monarchs, all kinds of stuff all over goldenrod at the end of the season um, when they need it the most. Let's see. <clears throat> so we have a, a picture of a potter wasp. They're feeding on nectar. Um, they build that nest that looks like a, um, an urn. And they, so they're taking uh, mud or they're taking soil and a little bit of water and they're mm, chewing it up and then they spit it out and build this nest and it takes them a couple of hours to build the nest. And then right when they're done, they stick their abdomen in the hole of the pot and they lay their egg and then they get a caterpillar or some prey item, paralyze it, stuff it in and seal that prey item in with the soon to emerge uh, larva so that it can be eaten alive. Good stuff. Some other wasps, we have sand wasps. Um, I've seen a large colony of these or an aggregate of their nests um, at the Fort Worth Nature Center. Also again in that sugar sand soil where it was bare. And so uh, sandy soil usually has, um, because it's so porous and it's really a rough environment for um, <clears throat> plants to grow in unless they're adapted, um, it leaves some bare spots on the ground. And those bare spots are where um, the uh, wasps like this will, will select for their nest. So one thing that I find really interesting about sand wasps is that they have these aggregate nests. Well, those nests are attracting parasites and they're attracting not only parasites, like parasites of themselves, but they're also attracting kleptoparasites, which are these flies and wasps who don't actually do the hunting themselves. They just go to an area of aggregate nests and want something else, like say that sand wasp captures uh, a, predator, a prey item, then these kleptoparasitic wasps or flies will then swoop in and take the prey item. And the other funny thing about sand wasps is they're preying <clears throat> sometimes even upon their own parasites. So it's like reverse parasitism. Um, it sound, seems like it's a really wild, uh, wild west thing going on there. Um, some other Another interesting um, insect is the ichnoamid wasp. And <clears throat> so they're parasitizing basically anything. They have these ovipositors that are really long. So when you see it, it looks like a whip tail. And that's where they lay their egg into the host. And they have uh, two different parasitic strategies. So one is, uh, excuse me if I don't pronounce this correctly, idiopoint, <laughs> which is they paralyze the um, host species or their prey, um, and it prevents the growth, the continued growth. So they, they'll parasitize, I mean, they're, they'll paralyze it, stuff it in their nest, and then that creature, the prey item is still alive, but it doesn't continue to grow. And the point <laughs> is um, a type of parasitic strategy where it's paralyzed, but the, the paralyzed creature is still growing while it's in the nest. And in both cases, the larva of the ichnoamid wasp is eating its host alive. Either way, you're paralyzed, you're not growing, or you're paralyzed and you're still growing. Either way, uh, you're getting eaten alive. Um, I think that the one where it allows the, the, the host to continue growing is pretty amazing. That's an amazing strategy. <clears throat> All right, next there. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to butterflies. I think most people know a lot about butterflies probably, so I don't spend as much time on them, but the things that I think are really fascinating about butterflies um, is that they are um, tasting everything with their feet. So whenever you see like a butterfly walking um, on poop, well, <clears throat> maybe they're tasting the poop, right? That's what I think of anyways. 
And that's why this little cartoon is like, I'll stay over here, thanks. I'm not gonna go walk on the poop. Um, they smell with their antenna and they have pheromones that they're releasing and it's getting picked up through the antenna. And of course they have scales, which is just very fine, you know, scales that are colored, different colors. And that's how you get this um, amazing color diversity, like my backdrop here. And of course they do, they have Chrysler. Um, so let's go to the next one. Uh, so I just put a, a monarch's life cycle or any butterfly's life cycle on here. They have five, five <clears throat> instars. So they go from egg, the five instars and, excuse me, each instar is where they're growing big, right? Cause they're eating. They're <clears throat> growing big and they're popping out of their skin. So that starts the next instar. And then they grow big again, they pop out of their skin. <clears throat> they keep doing that until finally they've had enough to eat. And then they attach to a substrate, um, form their chrysalis and they metamorph into a butterfly at a later point. Um, I just threw this on here so that you see the difference between a male and female monarch is simply the spot on the hind wing is on males and it um, has uh, pheromones, I believe. And so I do have a video, but I think I'm not going to show it because it's probably better for in-person presentations versus me showing it to you on YouTube because you can go look at it on YouTube. But it's just really fascinating to watch like a, a accelerated video of that whole process. All right, so we're going to do a poll. Let's see, what is my poll? Six. <clears throat> so I was wondering if you have ever seen a Christless in the wild um not one that you um nurtured yourself but you just stumbled upon it mm. <clears throat> i like my uh cowboy glass it's kind of hard to tell what it looks like <clears throat> on screen, but it's an awesome Wild West glass. All right, so we got about 86% of the vote in, so I'm going to end the poll and we'll share the results. So this is awesome. It looks like of everyone that voted, 72% um, have seen a Christless in the wild and 28% have not. Um, I don't see them very often. <clears throat> And when I do see them, I get super excited, right? And of course you gotta take a picture of it. But I think I think it's not really that common for people to see Chrysalis. Um, just because most people probably aren't looking for them. And as with everything, if you're actually putting out the effort looking for it, you're not gonna find it. So it has to be mostly happenstance, I think. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this, I'm just going to let y'all kind of look at it. Um, I uh, put some different butterfly species, what they, uh, what their host plants are and what their nectar plants are. Um, let's see, just a bunch of pretty pictures. But again, most of this is exclusively from my yard because I have lots of pollinator plants in my yard. Um, I guess the exception would be milkweed. I don't have the milkweeds in my yard. I only have probably two uh, butterfly milkweeds in my yard, but the rest of them are just out, out and about. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. And I put these on here, not to linger on them, but I just think uh, the herd museum did a really good job of um, a quick graphic to show what species we have here in this area. And then I had a poll for this. Y'all are probably getting tired of polls. Um, but we'll just do 
this is the next to the last poll. So we'll do it for fun. Butterflies collect pollen for their young. Do they or do they not? And please give me a minute. Okay, we got most everyone. Um, and in polling, share results. Um, so they do not collect pollen for their young. Um, that they're just kind of accidentally pollinating really because what their main thing that they're interested in is the nectar. Now, native bumblebees are collecting pollen for their young um, and for themselves. We'll go to the next one. Okay, so now we're gonna go to moths. Let me stop sharing the results and close out. Okay, there's a, moths are kind of, uh, not too many people are interested in them. They, you know, they're at night, we're usually at home in bed or just indoors watching TV or um, avoiding the heat. But there's actually quite a few naturalists that um, really pay attention to moths. <laughs> and, um, I know a couple of people who are on this presentation um, online and they go out and they do mothing and they're really, really good at identifying moths and um, exciting and encouraging other people to pay attention to moths because that's really moths, there's not a whole lot known about them. And you could go buy a book um, like the, the moths of North America or the moths of the Eastern US and the moths of the Western US. And it's thick, it's like probably one and a half to two inches thick and people don't know anything about moths but they are pollinators so they're most of them are nighttime pollinators but a few of them uh, pollinate during the day um, and also the difference with um, moths versus um, butterflies is that moths they uh, cocoon or pupate underground and they have feathery antenna instead of the uh, little ball antennas like butterflies have um, and again they're mostly at night versus in the daytime and butterflies aren't really they're not flying at night <clears throat> so the uh, clear wing moth here is a daytime or a diurnal pollinator and it mimics a uh, bumblebee it flies like a hummingbird. It could fly by you and you see it and you think hummingbird. And the reason on the wings um, that it's clear is because any of the scales have rubbed off, like any color. I mean, they don't really start out with color, but I think they have just like a light color and then it really uh, wears off. They fly like a hummingbird and their ho host plant is the coral berry and honeysuckle. Um, and this is a clammy weed. And again, this is one of those uh, types of flowers that requires a long tongue. And so if you've ever looked at a, a um, clear wing moth, they have a really long proboscis. <clears throat> so a polyphemus moth is those really big ones. They're like five inches, right? And if you've ever seen them, it looks like like owl eyes or something like a set of eyes on a wall and you're like oh my god what is that thing it's so huge well it's a polyphemus moth the eye spots um, probably evolved um, to detract or dissuade possibly like an owl or something i don't i don't know if an owl would you know go for it, but why would it have these big eye spots? It's not getting eaten by a uh, raccoon, right? It's not getting eaten by coyotes, so it doesn't really need eye spots to detract a coyote, so it might be owls that is de detracting um, <clears throat> from being eaten. Um, they can fly up to four miles to mate. Um, their host plant are tree species, of which I don't know, I think it's several different tree species, and they have a vestigial mouth, which means it's modified and reduced. So basically, they live to mate and die. So they'll mate, 
Um, they'll eat, obviously, leading up to um, when they're going through their pupil stage. Um, <clears throat> in their larval stage, they're, they're going to eat. Um, but then once they have emerged as adults, their main thing is just to go out and mate so that they can perpetuate the species. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the bagworm moth is something that a lot of people have probably seen on cedar. And so for the longest time, I never knew that that was actually an insect that made that. I don't know what I thought. I guess I thought like sap fell and some of the, the needles of the, the um, cedar kind of fell together. <laughs> but it's actually um, a moth that's up in that cocoon. So they, the female creates that cocoon and she just lives in there. And there's a hole at the bottom where she defecates out of. She doesn't have wings, so she's hanging out inside that um, cocoon, and then the male will come and find that hole, and they mate that way. Um, and then, um, then they have offspring, and then the offspring will leave and then go make, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, nest. Let's see. <coughs> so another interesting moth is the yucca moth. Um, that is, they're, they're obligate pollinators and herbivores of yucca, and this is really important. Um, it seems like not a very good survival strategy, but um, it, they're kind of like, um, they're doing everything at the yucca. So this picture I have right here is a pell yucca or pell leaf yucca, and um, well, I'll tell you a story in a minute, but uh, so, the, so this is the flowers are hanging down, right? They're drooping down. And that usually means it's going to be pollinated by a moth because they come up from below. Um, it's white or creamy white and pale. So it, it's opening, it stays open during the day, but it's open at night as, so as to attract the, the moths to pollinate. Um, <clears throat> so what obligate pollinator means is that they actually need the plant and they consume the plant. So they're, they can't, you can't have one without the other. Um, you can't have a yucca without the yucca moth and you can't have a yucca moth without the yucca. Um, so I was, uh, when I was at the nature center, we had uh, three different species of yucca at this one site. And there's a yucca that is not common at all. And it's endemic to North central Texas. It's called the Glen Rose yucca. And it looks, um, it looks basically like an Arkansas yucca. Now an Arkansas yucca is very common. And the only way you can tell the difference between an Arkansas yucca and um, Glen Rose yucca is if you let it, the flower stalk come up and then you see the structure of the flower stalk. Well, deer kept eating all of the flower stalks before they would um, shoot up. So there was no way I could tell or even collect seed from the Glen Rose Yucca. And the reason I was trying to collect seed is to send it to the state of Texas, um, their rare plant um, seed uh, reference, uh, ah, seed reserve. <laughs> um, so they actually have like a seed bank down in Houston at the Mercer Arboretum. And I was trying to collect the seed for them. So what I had to do is build a big exposure fence around it and I just got a bunch of patches of yucca and it didn't matter if it was Arkansas yucca or Glen Rose yucca, I just built a big old fence around it so the deer couldn't get in. And then once the stalk came up and seeded and uh, flowered and then produced seed, then I could go into that exposure and collect the seed. Well, <clears throat> when, I would, when I would collect the seed, I would open up a couple of them, they would have holes drilled into them because the yucca moth had gotten in and as larvae had eaten through all the seeds. So obviously you can't eat those seeds, you can't use, um, they're not gonna germinate. Uh, but the thing about the yucca moth is that even though they're laying their eggs in the seed of the plant that they need to live and to pollinate, their larvae aren't eating all of the seed. And then they're also pollinating the yucca so that the yucca will continue. Anyways, this <clears throat> it's just it's very fascinating. 
Um, let's see. So some other, um, another moth species is the banded sphinx moth. And you see that around us pretty big. Um, and sometimes it maybe looks like, not really like a hummingbird, but you, you might see it fly by and go, oh, that, that, no, that wasn't a hummingbird. It was, it was a big sphinx moth. Um, they're, uh, they're using Anothera or primrose species um, or what they prefer. And it's, um, the primrose usually has big, wide open um, flower, you know, with uh, large petals. They're opening at night and closing up in the day. So they're open at night. The moths are going to pollinate it at night and the light color attracts them to it so they can find it. Moths are also using their feathery antenna to, um, to identify mates and to not echolocate, but it helps them uh, with their flying during the night. Let's see, we'll go to the next one. Um, and then flies. So the flies are our last one. We went through bees, wasps, butterflies, and moths, and now we're on flies. So like I said, flies are kind of like the, um, uh, they're the underdog. People don't really like flies, don't care much about them, I guess. Um, a lot of flies superficially resemble bees because they're hairy. So bumblebees, you know, they have hairy abdomens. That's how you know a bumblebee is a bumblebee and a carpenter bee is a carpenter bee. Carpenter bees um, have shiny abdomen, not hair. But some of these uh, bees, I mean, these flies look like bees because they have hairy abdomens. Um, the life cycle of most of them are not known. Again, who cares about flies, right? <laughs> um, I mean, I do, but um, most people and researchers are not going to research flies. They're a good pollinator, um, but not, not that great. Let's see. Not as good as bees. Um, so this one's really interesting, the greater bee fly. Um, is this tiny little bee. It looks like a cartoon with this really long um, mouth part, but it's not a stinger. Uh, I mean, it they wouldn't sting you. But what they do is they, um, they'll go to their host um, prey item, so wh whatever they're going to predate, and if they can't get into the nest to, um, to attack or the prey item, they'll just take their, um, their eggs and they'll flick their eggs into the nest. So they're kind of like hovering somewhere and they're just throwing their eggs if they can't actually get into um, a nest to predate. Let's see, next slide. Uh, Longhorn beetle. So I have the, this really cool video um, of a longhorn beetle that I saw this weekend at Madden Prairie, which we'll see if I can show you that. Um, but basically they're feeding on dead wood, the larvae feed on dead wood, but they, um, the adults are using um, the nectar and pollen of flowers. So they're kind of accidentally pollinating because they're picking up pollen when they're feeding. <clears throat> and then they're also going to be nectar robbers. Um, because they can't always get down into the flowers. Um, so they'll pierce into the ne extra floral nectaries to access the nectar. And they're also known as mess and swell pollinators, which I think is funny is because they'll, um, let's see, they'll, they'll get on a large petaled flower and they're pollinating and they're pooping and they're just pooping where they're pollinating. Uh, or where they're eating because they're not pollinating intentionally. Um, let's see, let me share. Okay, here's this video that I took, um, let's see, when I was out at Madden Prairie. Let's see if I can play it. Oh, uh oh, let's see. Hopefully y'all can see that. It's on a white prickly poppy. And the uh, beetle is drilling into the flower. So the flower hasn't emerged. It's drilling into and eating um, down at the extra floral nectary. Okay, we'll go back to the presentation. Okay, 
hopefully y'all are all back um, and can see my screen. So the next uh, beetle that I'm going to talk about is the yellow marked crusted beetle. And these are the ones that you see all over pink evening primrose and they're always very dusty because they're getting pollen all over them. Um, they are, their larvae are wood boring beetles, but then the adults are um, feeding on the nectar. And you can kind of see, I don't know, it's hard to see, but they have pollen all over them. And they're flying with um, their hind wings only. Let's see, next. There. So this is kind of where I talk about threats of pollinators, and we all um, kind of know all of this. You probably see it on every presentation you've ever seen about almost anything natural history related. Um, but this picture I got from um, a former Texas Parks and Wildlife state entomologist <clears throat> where there's a goat farm and then there's nothing there because they've overgrazed that um, patch of land. But then on the other side of the road is this beautiful wildflower display on the right of way um, for the highway. And the goats I like to imagine are kind of looking over <laughs> at everything um, on the other side. But as you know, goats are browsers, they're not grazers, but if they have nothing else to eat, then just like we would, we would eat anything. Um, let's see, also just mowing. Um, we obviously have to mow for, to maintain areas, but, the, but we can have some areas that are less maintained and not mowed as frequently and we don't need acres and acres and acres of golf course lawns because that leaves nothing, nothing. It's a, it's a biological or ecological desert. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture I took when I was a forester for the city. It was um, once a treed area because it was in the floodplain of um, the Trinity River. However, I think it was probably like a pasture before it was developed into a neighborhood, but I just was like, especially when I was a forester and I was um, doing tree planting programs, I was like, this place needs something. There's nothing. There are no, there's no shrubs. There's no ornamentals. There are no trees. Um, but this is what we're doing. We're taking beautiful diverse areas and we're bulldozing them and then putting in lawns and there's nothing left for pollinators which means there's nothing left for birds there's nothing left for mammals there's nothing left for reptiles and amphibians because we've taken away the base of the food chain which are, which are the plants and then the pollinators um, obviously we all need somewhere to live uh, but it would be nice um, at, for each of us where we live to have some native uh, plants in our landscape and then share those native plants and ideas with others. Also ag um, is taking away from pollinators and herbicide. <clears throat> so I just had a little situation today that um, made me so mad. I'm already so upset about everything going on in the world and I'm on edge. And then I was, um, I had to pick my dogs up at the kennel. So I was driving on this farm to market road and I saw text dot, these big tank trucks full of herbicide and they were spraying they, like 20 feet out. They were just boom spraying all along the right of way, all the way to the fence line of the private property. And so I was like, when I get home, I'm going to call, I'm going to track down who the supervisor is who issued that order. I mean, I know TxDOT maintains the right of way. So uh, I called and I was very nice to the person that answered. She gave me the email of the supervisor. So I emailed him this very well composed um, email that didn't make me sound too crazy, but probably just crazy enough. Um, telling him all the reason, you know, basically, I don't have to tell y'all, y'all are watching a pollinator presentation. But what was so devastating about it is it wasn't like a right of way full of Johnson grass. It was a right of way that had uh, white rosin weed, which is a native endemic that's only in north central Texas out of the entire globe. It had 
probably four or five other native species. I know it because I stop there and collect seed. Um, and they're doing it all for miles and miles and miles. So they're, they're killing these last prairie relic that are existing on the side of the highway. Um, and then of course, just brushing in. If you have a dense pasture full of cedar, you're not gonna have very many flowering plants um, in there. So um, I just put this in uh, the Texas Conservation Action Plan for the Cross Timbers region. Um, Texas Parks and Wildlife has done one of these conservation plans for each region of Texas. So if you don't live in uh, the Cross Timbers region, you can Google this handbook and um, read what species are threatened or endangered or um, globally threatened, imperiled. <clears throat> but you see here we have 18 species that were listed on there of species of greatest conservation need. And Texas has over 1,300 species on that list. And most of them are rare or declining or they don't even have names, right? They don't even, they have like a Latin name, but they don't have a common name because we don't know anything about them. Um, let's see, like this <clears throat> mining bee that doesn't even have a common name. Um, also the Texas Alliance for America's Fish and Wildlife um, they have been uh, working with legislatures um, to pass the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And so that is for money from royalty, existing royalties um, from the energy and mineral production on federal lands, um, comes back to states, all 50 states. And so Texas um, can stand to, to receive 60 or more million dollars that would go not towards hunting um, because hunting is already supported from uh, sales tax and um, re hunting like um, guns and fishing license and all of that. Well, this money goes directly to grants through Texas Parks and Wildlife for habitat restoration and uh, different things that are non-game species. Uh, let's see, next slide. Get my cursor there. Um, so I was just, what is the native habitat here? I'm just showing like we've taken our native habitat and we've turned it into something that's not native. So one of the things um, in the parks department that I work for, uh, one of the things that I'm working on is how to, how to get more native areas, native and natural areas within the parks, instead of turning all of our parks into a sterile landscape. So what can you do? You can do these things. Many of you probably already are doing these things. Um, <clears throat> allow areas of your landscaping to be messy. I say messy because that's kind of in the eye of the beholder. Um, and all of these pictures are from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Let's see. What else can you do? Well, most weeds are not actually weeds. They are host plants and habitat and food sources for pollinators. So I liked this little uh, flyer that was um, for dandelions because so many people hate dandelions, but if you look at when they're blooming in February, you often see a lot of species pollinating them because that's the only, um, or getting nectar from them because that's the only food source. Let's see. And you can uh, just however you can grow plants in a greenhouse on campus or at a school if we are ever able to go back to schools and college campuses, develop a demonstration project in your neighborhood or your yard. Um, Jaime Gonzalez down in Houston, he works for the Nature Conservancy of Texas. He's turned his yard, a portion of his yard into a demonstration area and he puts signs up and he's living right in the middle of a neighborhood and they have like prairie parties in his, um, in his yard. So you could do that. It'd be a great way to educate your neighbors or bring your neighbors in. Um, you can collect seed. You can do plant exchanges. Um, you can add signage where appropriate. 
this prairie, this pollinator prairie patch is one that I designed um, for a couple of parks for the city of Fort Worth. And uh, unfortunately, I put a honeybee on it because I thought that's going to be the most recognized species by the average person um, who doesn't really know about uh, natural areas. But you can develop um, if you like to give presentations, especially now that everyone's doing Zoom, you could do live uh, Zoom presentations or in person at some point. Um, and you can support municipal regulations and projects that create or protect habitat um, at your local park, through your parks department, through um, like the city of Fort Worth has an open space committee and is actively saving open space now um, in addition to parks. And you can provide, like I said, this habitat. So this is a really good um, resource right here from Parks and Wildlife that was written by the entomologist for Texas Parks and Wildlife before he um, moved on. And it basically tells you all these things, create diverse habitat, for these pollinators. So for egg laying, for larval feeding sites, you want nest sites like dead trees or down trees, fairgrounds, standing dead vegetation for all these different things like the, grant, the ground nesters, the tunnel nesters, the cavity nesters. You want hunting and perch sites and you want overwintering sites as well. And I'm just gonna kind of go through this really quick. I don't really have uh, much to say about these other than these are um, pictures that I took um, in my yard. Uh, the different flowers and what pollinators I found on them. Uh, okay, the milkweeds. Okay, that wasn't in my yard. <laughs> um, that's the exception, but several different species of milkweed. Um, and then the yellow flowers, as we like to call them. Well, cowpen daisy is considered a weed um, and it, you find it in waste spaces, but it is one of the best pollinator plants and it's blooming from the early in the summer all the way into fall and it makes a great um, nectar source for monarchs. And again, all of these pictures were from my yard. And then Here's some more yellow plants, Jerusalem artichoke, Maximilian sunflower. Again, golden rods are excellent, excellent, excellent pollinator plants. <clears throat> and frostweed is blooming late in the season. That's another really good one. I find all kinds of pollinators on that, plus parasitoids and um, predators of pollinators like this ambush bug. Uh, let's see, next. Then, of course, mints. There are several native mints. There's actually, um, as far as bee balms, we have four bee balm uh, species that are just in North Texas, and they are like a magnet. That's why they're called bee balm. Um, they really attract the bees, and they also attract the predators of the bees. I think I don't have a picture there. Um, I often find um, spiders, lynx spiders on them. Oh, like this right here. Lynx spiders that are capturing the pollinators whenever they come up. And then here's a crab spider that's uh, gotten the sulfur. Here's lynx spider. Uh, robber fly. So a lot of these predators are going to be hanging out next to um, flowers so that they can catch their next meal. And resources, of course, the internet is full of resources. Um, Native Prairies Association of Texas is a good resource, the Xerces Society, really any of these listed plus a lot more um, are good resources. I've put some books here that I think are good resources. This one, the Butterfly Gardening um, for Texas. Very good book. Even if you're not going to do gardening, that's a good book. Uh, let's see. And then I just wanted to leave you with this. 
um, E.O. Wilson, if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. If insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse. And I do believe it would collapse into chaos for sure. And with that, Here's a nice little bee poster that's out on the internet and it, at the bottom it has all the different um, organizations that help um, promote and support conservation of native bees. And with that, 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 learn more about prairies from texasprairie.org.